I've had several fellows in from the band, a few of us that are left, and uh, we're each going to try to say a little something. The next man on the tape recorder will be Bill Rank. I hope he has a long tale to tell here. Hi, Doc. Well, it's sure a great pleasure to be here and see you again after all these years. And, um, of course, I just got back from Amsterdam and London on a trip over there, and uh, the uh, reaction over there about the old Gold Kit band and is just simply terrific. Uh, it's hard to realize the the uh, interest they have and uh, the uh, authenticity of their uh, information about the uh, records we'd made, and they wanted to know uh, all about Bix and uh, what kind of a fellow he was. And uh, I don't know, I just, I, uh, every day I answered a multitude of questions from everybody. And the people over there were just wonderful. I, I never realized that uh, uh, I would get such a reception. And in fact, I mean, it was a little uh, <laughs> embarrassing to me because I've never had anything like that happen to me. Uh, so then I went over to London and the same thing happened in London every day, questions and answers and so forth. And um, so I just got back this afternoon. So we have, uh, like Doc just mentioned, we had a few of the fellows over. We had Chauncey Morehouse here, which he will talk later on. And then Bill Chalice is here. And uh, it's just been a, a, been great to, to see these fellows again. And um, of course, there's not too many of us left anymore. So we want to try and get uh, some of the voices on this tape, and we'll have it from now on. So, um, well, uh, of course, uh, you know, the Gold Kid Band broke up in 1927, and uh, a few of us, uh, Don Murray and myself, and Frank Trombar, Bix, uh, and Joe Venuti, uh, all went with Adrian Rulini into the uh, New Yorker cafe on Broadway, which was formerly was the Whiteman Club. And uh, unfortunately, the, the band didn't last any more than nine weeks in the place. And it wasn't the fault of the band, I don't think. It was just, uh, just didn't draw uh, no business. So uh, when that uh, band folded, uh, I had heard that uh, Nat Shokut was going in the Strand Theater, and of course I knew Nat from recording on the with the Goldhead Band and Victor. So I went up to see Nat and I told him, I said, I, I hear you're going to the Strand Theater. I said, you, are you all set on all the men? He said, no. He said, what do you got in mind? I said, well, I, I'd like to go with you. So I went in the Strand Theater with Nat Shulker. So, uh, of course, Nat was no showman. He didn't draw on. So that only lasted about nine weeks. But be before the end, uh, I had re uh, received a, a wire from Bill Chalice and asking me if I'd like to join the Whiteman Band. Well, at that time, Paul was at his height, and it was a great honor to, to uh, be able to join the band. So I jumped at the chance and uh, gave my notice to Nat Shokert. And when I told uh, Nat uh, what I was going to do, his answer was, why? And I said, well... After all, Paul Whiteman's Paul Whiteman. He says, well, he says, you know, he says, my, my trombone player, Chuck Campbell, he says, uh, can't handle all the work. He says, I can keep you both busy. So uh, I uh, said, well, no, I, I think I'll go with Paul. I just wonder what would have happened if I'd have stayed in New York and freelanced around. Maybe I'd have done all right, maybe I wouldn't. I don't know. But uh, uh, I surely... I uh, won't regret, or I don't regret, ever going with Paul, because I learned an awful lot. And uh, then, uh, of course, I stayed I stayed with Paul for 11 years, 1927 to 1938. And uh, then uh, we started jumping around the country, and I had two children by that time, and uh, got married, all did an early stay with Whiteman. So, uh, Trumbar had gone to California. He had left the band. And, uh, 
And uh, Frank was uh, naturally a good friend of mine, and <clears throat> I uh, decided to go out to California also. Well, uh, I stayed in California for about four years and did radio and rec recordings, and then uh, finally was Paramount Studios staff orchestra, uh, which I was there for about two years. And uh, about that time where the uh, war started, and a Japanese submarine was sighted off the coast of California. My wife said, let's get out of here. And they'd already corralled the, uh, most of the Japs and put them in a sort of a concentration camp. And so uh, we packed up and moved back to Cincinnati. And, and I went in, finally went in the radio station WLW on staff there. And I was there for about six years. And uh, then I uh, uh, came back to New York and and uh, did some television and and uh, recordings in New York for a while, but I didn't move my family to New York. I commuted back and forth about every week or two. And so uh, after that, uh, I didn't do much in the professional way as far as a livelihood, and uh, so I. Uh, Finally, got a day job and just played on weekends and so forth, and uh, just enough to keep my lip up. And so, uh, one thing led to another, and a couple other jobs and so forth. And time marched on, and so now I'm now with the uh, Ethna Casualty Insurance Company in Cincinnati, in the office there, and and I have uh, one more year to go, and uh, and they're going to kick me out, and. Uh, so then I had this vacation come coming up, and I thought, well, I have never taken a good trip, and I've never been to Europe, so I thought, this is a chance right now, so here goes. And so I decided to go to Amsterdam because a, a fellow had corresponded with me from Amsterdam and asking me all these questions about Vix and the Gold Cat Band and so forth, and seemed like a nice fellow. And, I thought, well, I'm going to take a trip over there and see him. So I drove up to uh, New York by way of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I saw a trumpet player by the name of Dick Getz, who uh, played at WLW with me. And uh, then from there, I went on up to uh, New Hope, Pennsylvania, where I saw Mrs. Whiteman. And uh, I spent the night in the Whiteman house and even slept in Paul's bed. And... Uh, we talked about midnight about the band and Paul in general. And from there I went on up to Cortland, New York, and I spent a day up there with Spiegel Wilcox, who was the other trombone player with the, with the Go-Kit band. And uh, had a great time with him. I even uh, went up to Syracuse with him, and he had a job that night with his band, so I went, up along, went along with him and uh, played the job with him. He had a valve trombone, and he let me play a slide trombone. And, uh, of course, I didn't get paid, but I had a good time. <laughs> so then I, uh, I wanted to, Mrs. Whiteman told me about the uh, Whiteman collection up at uh, Williamstown, Massachusetts, and all of uh, Paul's scores and big transcriptions and pictures and everything is all up there. And uh, so I decided to go up to see it. I went up there, and then this uh, Erwin Shaneman, who was the curator of the uh, collection, uh, showed me around, and and then he told me about, uh, he says, well, he says, you're going over to England. He said, there's a man over there, he said, that uh, uh, you should see. And he says, he knows all about the Whiteman Band, the Gold Kit Band, and Bix and everything. So he said, I will drop him a line and tell him you're coming. So. Uh, then I came back, uh, dropped uh, back into New York here and stayed overnight at the Taft Hotel. And the next morning I uh, came out to see Doc and decided to leave my car here and get away from that uh, highway robbery in New York of storing your car. And uh, so Doc took care of my car for me and uh, I took off for Amsterdam and uh, I was met by this fellow and his friends and they uh, the whole band was there this little band that they have 
and uh, they just couldn't do enough for me over there and I, I was uh, as I say it was a little embarrassing at times because uh, I'm not used to that red carpet treatment but uh, they showed me all around uh, Amsterdam and uh, the beer was just delicious uh, and the food was good and the people were just so friendly and uh, just seemed to can't do enough for you and I stayed in Amsterdam for eight days and then uh, went on to uh, London and I must say I like Amsterdam better than London but although I had a, a nice a good time in, in London and uh, I met this uh, uh, man that uh, Irvin Shaneman wrote Charles Waring is his name and he and a man by the name of George Garlick uh, wrote a book called uh, Bugles for Biderbeck. And it was published only in England. And uh, they were very nice to give me a copy of the book, which I have now. And, of course, I brought back a lot of pictures and so forth. And, and then I was interviewed by the, the uh, Melody Maker magazine over there. And... Uh, so I was only in London six days, and uh, took the finally left there this morning, and uh, arrived here. Supposed to be here at 1:30, and we got here in a driving rainstorm. And uh, Norma met me at the plane and got out here about approximately 3:30. And so then he said that the uh, doc said that they were going to have Chauncey and Bill Chalice over and. So uh, we all had dinner together, and so here we are, uh, just uh, mulling over old times and playing records and and uh, regular gab fest. So that uh, I think that about brings me up to date what I've been doing, and and in the future I'll still still play if I can if I can. And now I'll try and play a little something uh, to add to the tape that you've already made, Doc. And I hope it turns out all right. great, Bill. You had a real nice life, I think. I think maybe we ought to say the date is July the 24th, 1968, so we'll know where to place this. Our records, uh, there's a lot of information on the records that were missing, that was missing, because nothing was ever written down or put down in any form. Now everybody's trying to find out when a record was made and who played on it and everything else. So I guess it's a good thing to date everything, and, you know, when it happens. So um, I think uh, I about uh, told about enough about myself here, so why don't we uh, have a word with from Bill Chalice? Well, I'm glad to be over here tonight. I haven't seen uh, Doc to talk with for a long, long time. Doc and Norma. Uh, it's a very pleasant visiting with them. 
It was nice to see Chauncey, and it was much nice, uh, very nice, to uh, to see uh, Bill and hear about his trip. Oh, he said that before who I am. I'm Bill Chauncey. I was the arranger for this outfit, and uh, I didn't, don't get to see too many of these guys anymore. Now I'll tell you how I got started in this thing. I had a band at Bucknell, and uh, I started making arrangements for the band for the full four years I was there. I got a little experience that way. After I got out, I played with some little band from uh, Williamsport, and uh, at one time we were in the vicinity of Detroit and Toledo, to be exact. And uh, I wanted to go up to uh, Detroit to hear the Greystone Band. I'd heard so much about it, and I knew that I uh, that some of the boys that I played with before were there playing. Uh, in, in the Scranton Sirens Orchestra, that's right. So, when I got up there to hear them, there was uh, Russ Morgan, Fuzzy, Fuzzy Farrar, Itsy Riskin, and uh, Jimmy Dorsey. I think that was all that I played with. So they put in a big plug with Charlie Horvath, the manager for me to make some arrangements. And he gave me a couple to do. So, so I wound up with an arrangement to do, which wound up with Owen Bartlett at the book. I never heard much more about it. Uh, however, the Greystone Band went on the road that fall, and they came through my hometown. And uh, I talked to uh, Ray Ludwig, and he suggested I make an arrangement of Babyface, which I did. And uh, I think, uh, let's see, he told me to make one of Blue Room, which I did. And then shortly after that, I got a telephone call from Horvath, who was up in Southboro. The band was up there. And he told me to bring all my instruments up. So when I got there, I heard my arrangements played, but played. I asked Charlie if he wanted me to play, and he said, saxophone players are a dime a dozen and we need arrangements. Why don't you make some more? And so he made me an arranger right then and put me on a salary. So now I find myself with a great band that has great ideas and great soloists. I can't help make good arrangements for this outfit. The records made by our band were not really representative of its greatness. At that time, we were described by the company as non-commercial. Actually, the band was way ahead of its time. Later on, when the Victor Company let us do as we wished, we turned out a few sparklers, such as Sunday, My Pretty Girl, Clementine, and others. I picked up a lot from the band's ensemble playing, working out courses with Bix Beiderbeck and Frank Trombar, and getting excellent suggestions from the rest of the band. I owe that outfit a lot. That night in Atlantic City, during the Million Dollar Pier engagement, when Jimmy Dorsey brought Whiteman, with whom he and Tommy were then playing, Henry Buzzy, Manny Malnick, Bing Crosby, and others of his band down from a Philadelphia theater engagement to hear our band. That was another lucky break for me. The news that the Goldcat Band was about to disband had got around, and I suppose a little scouting was in order. 
Whiteman said he'd have no part of vulturing, but that the guys he'd like to have with him could feel free to have a fling at New York radio and recording and join him later if and when they wished. I was one of them, and I chose to join him as soon as he'd have me. I got starry-eyed when I thought of those fiddles, eight reed men, four trumpets, four trombones, and an arranging staff headed by Ferdy Grofey, whose work I had admired from a way back. Also, all those recordings and choice tunes. Besides recording, the band schedule already begun would include a two or three year theater tour, a concert tour, a European tour, and a Hollywood moving picture, if all I heard were true. I joined the following month in September at the New York Paramount. As it was set up for me, I was to go along on the theater tour for 10 weeks until Chicago, where we'd record, to observe, listen, do whatever arranging I could under the circumstances, and get acquainted with the guys. A small pedal organ they carried with the baggage would be deposited in my hotel room in each city. I floated on a New York. Jimmy Dorsey and I were roommates from the beginning. Charlie Margulis came into the band about two weeks out, then followed Steve Brown. Steve didn't get any happier trying to find a place in all that manuscript, and there would be no dance engagements for some time. But he was great when the occasion arose. Then a few weeks later in Indianapolis, Bix and Tram joined. I first met Hoagie Carmichael in Indianapolis. Whiteman and Jimmy brought him to the hotel to play over his washboard blues, which he was to record with us. During these next few months, I thought the band sound hit a peak at the recording sessions. It had a good ensemble, a good spirit, the soloists were good, and it made some good records. However, four and five shows a day isn't the type of musical diet on which to maintain enthusiasm. Tommy gave his notice in Chicago, and we were fortunate to get Bill Rank as a replacement. Steve Brown and Jimmy gave theirs not long after, and Min Lybrook and Izzy Friedman replaced them. Whiteman and Jack Robbins were partners in a publishing venture called Whiteman Publications and formed to publish compositions performed by the Whiteman Orchestra. Malnick and Frank Signorelli had composed a few which were recorded, also Ferdy, Lou Alder, and others. Now Robbins was around pressing Bix to add a broad strain to his inner mist like the Rhapsody in Blue. Bix liked the idea and came up with it like it is now. The notation took us a little time. Later on, I notated candlelights, flashes, and in the dark for him. I thought they were great. I can't remember anything of his that wasn't. Bix was very interested in composing. At one time in New York, when we were working on In the Dark, he told me he'd like to leave something behind so he'd be remembered. After he died, I took down his Davenport Blues from an old Wolverine's record. When I returned from the road trip and settled in New York, Ferdy and I became good friends. When I told him I felt I was slower than Shinola and perhaps some instruction would help, he took me to Pietro Floridia, his teacher, and I began to study. As I went along, I felt I was being helped considerably. But I never did get to that fast man plateau, or I could make an arrangement in the subway on the way home. Whiteman switched his recording affiliation to Columbia Records. And when the band returned to New York, he closed out his Victor tenure with a batch of about 50 recordings made at the old Lederkrantz Hall studio. The whole band seemed to enjoy these sessions, and I got to use Bix in a lot of my arrangements. I still think he has had no peer in his field. 
The concert trip began at Carnegie Hall, and some time later, Vix returned to New York, ill. He spent a few days in a hospital in Astoria, then went home to Davenport to recuperate. He was not away long, but some time later, there was a repetition. When he returned to New York the second time, he waited around to rejoin, but it never materialized, and he was quite disappointed. During the time the band was on the coast making the King of Jazz picture, I got a phone call one afternoon from Fletcher Henderson. His band was rehearsing in Vincent Ullman's production, Great Day. And he asked if I would like to make some arrangements for Mr. Ullman's. And if so, would I come right along to the theater and meet him? It was a nice experience. We made an appointment at his office and I got Whiteman's permission to do the work. A tune called More Than You Know. Billy Rose was one of its lyric writers. Marion Harris was to sing it. He played it for me several times exactly as he wanted it orchestrated, whistling the melody as he played. Then he had her sing it till she was tired. Then he gave me a manuscript copy of what he had just played to take home. Understanding? This guy owned it. He liked the orchestration and we got together several times after that. I was grateful to Fletch. When the King of Jazz picture opened at the Roxy Theater in the spring of 1930 with the stage appearance of Paul Whiteman and his orchestra with George Gershwin at the piano playing the Rhapsody in Blue, it was as if people were saying, so what? After one week, the band took a forced vacation and was promptly cut down to 16 men. Among those lopped off with Joe Venuti, Eddie Lang, Lenny Hayton, and others was yours truly. I freelanced after that. For several years, I made arrangements and rehearsed them for the Casa Lomo Orchestra when it was building. I made arrangements for Fletcher when he was at Connie's Inn in Harlem. In radio, I worked for Don Voorhees when he played for Russ Colombo and John Charles Thomas. I notated and arranged for Willard Robeson and his Deep River Orchestra in radio. And I did a lot of work for Nat Shilkert over a period of years. I made orchestrations for Billy Rose when he had his nightclubs and shows. I worked for Dick Himber when he had the uh, Studebaker Champions. I worked for Victor Young, Frank Black, Gus Henschen, Bobby Dolan, Mark Warnell, Lenny Hayden on the first Lucky Strike hit parade. Through Charlie Margulis, I made orchestrations for Kate Smith for about three years. For my first assignment, Jack Miller, the leader of the orchestra, came to my house and handed me a record. It was one of Russ Morgan's. I looked at him. He said, take it off, like it is, note for note. When I saw him after the show, I got fine arrangement, Bill. I was in solid. I enjoyed a six-month stint with Artie Shaw before he went into the Navy. One day I ran into Frank O'Keefe in front of the RCA building at Radio City, and he hired me for the Glenn Gray Orchestra, F.C. O'Keefe, silent partner. It used to be the Casa Lomo Orchestra. I was hired to make arrangements, rehearse the band, and roughly have some kind of charge of the music and sort out the four Fs. While I was with him, I got to make an album with Bobby Hackett for Milt Gabler at Coral. For over 20 years, I have lived in Massapequa at 151 Dartmouth Road. I do an occasional bit at music, work in my garden, and take care of my house. The date is Friday, December 13th, 1968. Hey, Fred. Hello, this is uh, Fred. They called me Fuzzy when I was in Detroit with the Gold Cat outfit. And I'm in the company of two of my old friends here, Doc Riker and Bill Rank. Bill Rank just got home from a trip, and he's been over here telling us about it. It was very interesting. I enjoyed it, and I wish I could have taken the trip myself. And they want me to say a few words about what I've been doing since I left the Gold Cat band. Well, right off the reel, as soon as I get finished with Gold Cat, I stayed in New York a while, 
nothing happened. I made four or five trips back to Detroit and played a couple of jobs with Gene and uh, finally decided that I would come back to New York again and stay there a little while, which I did, and still nothing happened. And the, and the next time I went back to Detroit, as soon as I got back, I had wires from, talked to, from Nat Shilkwit and from uh, uh, this fellow that has the Meyer Davis office. And I had all kinds of chances to go in the, the different theaters like the Paramount and the Capitol and the Roxy and all these places. So I decided to come to New York and go with Nat Shilkwit. And I was glad I did because later on, some of the boys like Bill Rank, we were all in the same outfit. Well, we played there in the Strand Theater, possibly about four or five, six weeks maybe. And uh, Nat fixed us all up with recordings in the meantime. So we were making a pretty good uh, salary, able to get along pretty well. So finally, after the strand closed, we disbanded. I don't know where some of the fellows went, but I got a job with Donald Voorhees, and I went into the uh, George M. Cohan Theater with uh, with a show, Rain or Shine. Uh, what's that fellow's name? I can't think of the fellow's name. There's a star in there. Oh, Joe, Joe Cook. He was a star, and also uh, Tom Howard was in it and uh, some of the other fellows that later turned out to be announcers on radio. Well, we had a whole year's run in there. And in the orchestra there was Jimmy Dorsey and Charlie Butterfield and Joe Venuti there. I know that would interest some of the boys to know that Joe Venuti was in there and Frankie Signorelli. Okay. And uh, well, we played a whole year. Manny Klein was in there and uh, Arnold Brillhart played saxophone and Jimmy Dorsey played saxophone. Dudley Fosick played mellophone. And we we had a very nice time. Max Farley also, by the way, was in it. And we, we enjoyed ourselves there for about a year. And we did a lot of recordings and still got jobs like the, uh, we, we didn't lose our connections with, with Nat Shilkrit. And we made them with, I, I was working for about seven or eight photograph companies. And uh, finally, I got a job with a fellow by the name of uh, Sam Lannon, and uh, he guaranteed me 11 recordings a month to start out with, and he had two, phone, uh, two radio dates. One was called the, uh, we used to play the, the song Smile, and it was called the I Panet, uh, Panet Troubadours, and another one was called the Ingram Shavers. And uh, I did this date with him for about three years. And we had some of our boys that we had worked with in the Gold Cat outfit would come in once in a while. And then Don started getting dates on, on radio. And we did the, uh, the General Motors program on the radio. And we did the, uh, oh, the Armstrong Quakers. And, oh, a dozen, a dozen other dates. Don had about 12 radio dates a week. Bond Bread. And we had, uh, and then I got acquainted with some of these fellows in the recording studios, and they started. And Nat Shilkert had the Ever Ready Hour, remember that? And Bill Rank sitting here, he says, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and, uh, oh, we, we did so much. And then uh, I finally, uh, after monkeying around with radio for about 10 or 12 years, we started to get television dates. And of course, Don was right in on the ground floor of this. And uh, uh, he also had the telephone hour on radio, which we did. I did that for 18 years. And he also had the Cavalcade of America, which I did for 18 years, off and on. I did it with Harold Levy, too. And then I was a houseman for NBC, and I was a houseman for WJZ, which is now called WABC. And I played as a houseman with Freddie Rich in the Columbia, which is now Columbia, it was WABC then. And uh, Tommy and Jimmy played in that outfit too. And Leo McConville was in that outfit. And uh, oh, between all these things, we had so much, so much to do. After playing this uh, telephone hour for 18 years and the other dates, 
and uh, Don started getting these television jobs. The first one I did was with Fritzy Sheff, with Faye Emerson, and with Elliot Roosevelt, and uh, then we did another one with Azio Pisa, and we did another one with, uh, with, a, with an orchestra leader by the name of Ming Merlin, Ving, Ving Merlin, and uh, he, he was well known as a lady orchestra leader. And I had worked with all the Spitalnys, even in the NBC, and with Spitalny, the man that had the girls orchestra later. And of course, mainly with Don, and I worked with this uh, fellow with the Band of America. Uh, his name was uh, no. Joe Yusufer, and they, he changed his name to Paul Laval. His name is Joe Lee Yusufer. I have nothing against the name, but uh, to, to make things clear, you, you know who it is if I tell you that his name was formerly Joe Yusufer. Oh, well, we had so many of these things. There's so so many jobs that we did. And I, I had all these different phonograph companies and, and radio dates and worked with different leaders. I must have worked with 200 different leaders in New York. And I had chances to go with everybody, but I never could realize my main ambition. And that was to get one job that paid enough dough that you didn't have to hook you around. So finally, I decided to give up to all the work. The last time when they went on television, when Don went on television with the telephone hour, I called up the contractor, Bill Tron, and told him, I says, I'm not interested, I'm gonna retire. Okay, that's about all I got to say. But I accept that I'm enjoying my, the company here with Bill Frank and Doc Riker and his wife, Norma. And I've had a very nice morning here. So fellow you just heard speaking and playing called himself Fred was Fred Farrar. I heard this tape off, but I didn't tell what's happened to me since the Gold Cup band, so I'll try and get that in. I stayed in New York to study clarinet with Gustav Langenis and flute with George Purcell and Harry Thorne, two George Barrer pupils. Soon was picked by George Gershwin to play in the orchestra for a musical he had written. The music uh, was for a show called Funny Face, and it featured Fred and Adele Astaire, and the leader was Al Newman. Gershwin picked me personally to play this show, and I played several other Schubert shows after that, went into the Astor for a year, Played the Hollywood Restaurant and the Palais d'Or and other places. Club for Mara Davis. Had a band and a place in Yorkville for a year. Then I studied saxophone with Merle Johnson with teaching in mind and did teach for several years. In 1941, I went with the Sperry Gyroscope Company in a clerical capacity, which turned out to be quite satisfactory. I stayed with them for 23 years and then retired. I never really played any more jobs after 1937. And during the war, I sold my instruments to a musician who had his horn stolen. Shortly after retiring, Norma and I took a motor trip of 10,000 miles around the US and Canada. Visited with friends along the way and went to Las Vegas and Disneyland and Yosemite and most of the other places of interest. So 
saw Paul Mertz and Owen Bartlett in Los Angeles. We live in Beechhurst, Long Island, New York, near Flushing, but spend the summer in a small summer place we have near Peekskill, New York, and four or five months of the winter in Daytona Beach, Florida. We have visited Nassau and Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, and in August we were going to Bermuda. Just before we came back from Florida this winter, we went to Hawaii for 17 days. Norma and I celebrated our 42nd wedding anniversary on Easter Sunday in Hilo, Hawaii. Had a great time in Honolulu, where we had friends, including a musician friend who bought my horns. We stopped overnight in Los Angeles on the way back and spent a wonderful afternoon and evening with Paul Mertz and his wife and Owen Bartlett and Steve Pasternacki. Much reminiscing and food. We are traveling a lot while we are still financially and physically able. We keep in pretty good health by being active. Besides the work of keeping several homes going, we dance quite a lot. Norma always loved to dance, and at Sperry, as Sperry had a ballroom dance club, we joined and became reasonably proficient. We taught the cha-cha, rumba, and tango in Daytona this past winter. We dance a couple of times a week in New York, and three or four times a week in Florida. Not glamorous like the music business, but a fairly good substitute. Well, goodbye for the present as that covers my existence up to now. Hello, this is Chauncey Morehouse. There is so much to say, and I hardly know where to start. I think it would be good first to say that um, I joined the Golkett Band through Russ Morgan. I was playing with Ted Weems at the time, and uh, when Ted went broke in Canton, Ohio, uh, the whole band was left high and dry. But by some good fortune, uh, I received a wire that same night from Russ Morgan asking me if I could join the Goldkett Band. So I wired him immediately, and uh, Evelyn and I uh, took the train for Detroit where Russ met us. Uh, this was probably the best break that ever uh, happened to me, for uh, we didn't have enough money to get back to New York. Uh, Russ took me the next day up to meet uh, Gene in the office, and we sat down and we had a very friendly talk. But Gene told me that he thought that I wouldn't be able to play right away on account of some union uh, uh, business uh, or law that they had out there, where you had to, uh, I think, establish yourself before you could take any work. So uh, in any event, they ordered me to be on hand at the Greystone Ballroom. So uh, Charlie uh, Horvath, uh, the manager of the Greystone, was playing drums uh, that night, that first night I was in Detroit. And after a set or two, he asked me to come up and sit in, <laughs> uh, which I did. So. Uh, I never left the band after that. I, was, I became the drummer. Uh, the union man, of course, followed uh, this whole thing up and wanted to know why I was suddenly uh, put into this band. And uh, Charlie gave them the old uh, cock and bull at which he was very uh, proficient and said, uh, someone said that Morehouse was in the audience and I always wanted to hear him play and so I invited him up and he sounded so good that I hired him. And uh, that was that. Uh, in the meantime, or rather, uh, the necessity for this uh, was very apparent. Uh, Charlie was playing drums with uh, one hand and signing checks on the timpani head with the other, and he just had too much to do around the Greystone. And that uh, provided the opening for me. The band that night uh, had the uh, following personnel. Uh, Russ was the conductor. On trumpets were uh, Fuzzy and Ray Ludwig. Uh, on trombones, Bill Rank and uh, Spiegel Wilcox. Doc Riker on first saxophone. Jimmy Dorsey playing second and hot. And, uh, of course, Don Murray on tenor. 
Howdy Clicks, so was the banjo, uh, Steve Brown bass, and Louis Longo from Philadelphia was the uh, piano player. Now, uh, Fuzzy and Bill have uh, told uh, you about Nat Chilkrit and Sam Lannan and Don Voorhees, and so I can hardly add much to that except that I, too, did the same dates that uh, Fuzzy did with Chilkrit. And I, too, uh, played the different, uh, especially the jazz dates of Sam Lannan. Sam Lannan had perhaps a half a dozen bands, all of the same personnel, but each working under a different name for a different label. And this is the way uh, I guess he made a million. He should have. He was so busy. In those days, uh, uh, we did horn recording. There was no microphones in those days. And this horn was uh, uh, protruded from uh, the recording room behind the uh, 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 recording studio. It was one long horn that looked like the old-time Victor horn, only much bigger and much longer. Uh, we all aimed our sound at it. And uh, getting uh, back and forth uh, from it was uh, most times hazardous, but uh, always intimate. Uh, the music was hung up to the ceiling. The music racks uh, had the, the sticks from the ceiling on which the music rack was fastened at the bottom of the stick. And this saved the uh, confusion of quickly wading through music racks and getting back to the ensemble position after a solo. Um, I might as well say something about the uh, wax that uh, we used to make the master. This was a uh, composition wax. Uh, it was about uh, an inch and a half thick, and as I remember, it was a dirty yellow. Uh, it rode a very heavy uh, turntable, which uh, must have been uh, faultlessly engineered. Uh, the source of power was a 50-pound weight. It was round, but it was flat uh, at the top and the bottom, which uh, slowly made its way to the floor. It hung also from the ceiling by a uh, steel cable, which was controlled by a governor, uh, which afforded it a slow, even drop. Uh, after about five minutes, it would reach the floor, and then it would be wound up to the ceiling again. I mean, for each take. I also played uh, the season uh, with Adrian Rollini's New Yorkers. Uh, this was a fine band, and we were, uh, I think there was more uh, mutual admiration in this band than in any that I have ever played with. Uh, each one respected the other's ability, and uh, we didn't step on each other's toes. There was no jealousies or animosities. It was just a uh, happy band, too happy to be successful. I remember that uh, Roger Kahn used to come in and uh, sit under the piano. He didn't want anyone to recognize him because his family frowned on, uh, although they bought him the most expensive instruments, they frowned on uh, him uh, uh, playing jazz. So he used to sit under the piano, and Adrian would give him a kick, and he would take a chorus from under the piano. Uh, he played uh, clarinet at the time, and also accordion. I played the uh, Don Vory show, uh, Rain or Shine, right after the Goldcat band broke up, rather uh, after the New Yorkers broke up. And I was with Fuzz. Fuzzy named everyone in the pit except me. Okay, Fuzz, you have one coming to you when I see you next. I also played uh, Don's radio shows. I started out with one show, The Bond Bread, with uh, Frank Crummett and Julius Sanderson. Then I played the Fuller Brush show with him, too. And at that same time, I was doing shows with uh, Sam Lannan, the Ipana Troubadours, as you have heard before. And uh, all of the records, uh, most of the jazz records that Sam was doing. And I had a busy time, uh, just as busy as Fuzz.
Later on, later on, I uh, joined uh, Roger Wolf Kahn at the Roosevelt Hotel. Uh, this was a band in which he had uh, Farley as saxophone and Artie Shaw as saxophone, uh, Tea Garden on trumpet, Andy Russo on trombone, Perry Bodkin on uh, guitar, and uh, Wardley bass, Larry Binion on tenor. Quite a band. Uh, we played uh, a winter season down there, too. I don't know which year it was, but I know when I drove up, it was snowy most of the time. I uh, had another radio date, which meant quite a lot to me, and that was the uh, CBS Swing Date, Saturday Night Swing. I think it was called the Saturday Night Swing Club. Uh, Leith Stevens was the conductor. Uh, as I understand, Leith is now the instructor uh, at uh, uh, I'll get it uh, UCLA uh, in uh, movie arranging a friend of mine uh, Gene von Holberg once showed me some of his homework and it's just uh, fabulous no one <clears throat> well uh, for the next uh, oh I guess 20 years I was an outside man doing uh, radio shows and later on TV shows. Uh, Peter Van Steeden was my uh, most uh, reliable leader. Uh, and for 16 years, I worked for him. Uh, he started the Fred Allen Show uh, with the nucleus left over from Lenny Hayden's band. Lenny Hayden really started the Fred Allen Show. But he was called to Hollywood to do a movie and gave it up after a few weeks. And then Peter took it over with uh, some of, uh, of Lenny's band and uh, some of his own. Uh, for seven years, we did the uh, Fred Allen show, the entire run of the show. And as I said, for 16 years, I did everything that Peter had. As he was one of the busiest men in town, as was Shuk Shilkert. I might say about Shilkert, uh, one time he left for the coast suddenly, and I had six shows a week with him. And uh, when he left, uh, all of the shows were given to other orchestra leaders who had their own personnel, and I was left high and dry once more. So I had to work my way around and advertise myself available. The last shows that I did, uh, were, was the, the last show, in fact, was the uh, $64,000 question, uh, which I did uh, for the run of the show, which was three years. At that time, they had three $64,000 questions, uh, all under different names and on different uh, uh, networks. So I was doing them. In fact, I did more quiz work at the end of my uh, TV career than uh, most anything else. I might say, uh, sort of in parenthesis, that uh, after the dentist got through me, uh, with me this afternoon and gave me a substitute bridge for the one he's repairing, uh, that uh, I'm lisping tonight. Pardon. Well, uh, for the past 10 years, I have been rather semi-retired. I, I still do the Goldman Band in the summertime as bass drummer. And uh, this uh, last season was my sixth year. I enjoy this very much, although really uh, concert band music is not my dish. Uh, but Goldman is a wonderful man to work for, and it keeps my hand in. And this is uh, most valuable to me. In the meantime, I keep practicing on the, uh, down in my studio in the basement, and uh, I like modern music. I try to understand it, and I do understand most of it. Uh, some of the uh, rock and roll today sounds like, almost like what my father and I played as uh, when I was 14 years old, with uh, some variation and new, new ideas. Uh, however, I don't have any trouble to understand what they're doing today, and basically I love jazz, so I uh, have a rather happy life. I hope that this uh, information that I have uh, contributed tonight <clears throat> will add to Doc's tape, and uh, now I might as well uh, play a little tune and bow out.
was just a little tune that I wrote. Uh, I tried to preserve the style that I, I used with the old Boswell Sister records and the Merrimack records. Hello, gang. This is Fitzy. How long is it we have? Oh, how long have we seen one another? Don't ask how many years. Well, when the band broke up in New York, I went to, of all people, B.A. Ralph with his lucky shock orchestra for the sublime to the ridiculous. Of course, the um, green stuff was good, so I had no objection, and I became the chief arranger for Lucky Strike. And we ran for some time. Jimmy and Tommy were both in the band. They played on and off. And then uh, when, I, when that thing broke up, I went to A.B.'s Irish Rose, which was on the air, a very popular show on the radio, and I wrote the cue music for that. Then I... Um, a program of my own together called Tin Type Tenor, which I was partnered with another gentleman. And as you can see, Tin Type Tenor refers to the good old horse and buggy days. We had a very nice program. It was on uh, for about a couple of years. We never sold it. After that, um, I went to Cliff Edwards, if you remember him. There was a strike and no instruments were allowed to play, so he had his program, and I had uh, five voices in back of him. I've gone into the vocal field pretty deeply. Then after that, I did a uh, thing called Rex Irving, which was based on the style of uh, Raymond Scott. I had a little novel combination. Then after that, if you remember the ASCAP BMI fight, uh, when no ASCAP tunes were allowed in the air. I went over to Columbia Broadcasting as a tune detective there. That wasn't too easy, you know. Tune come in, you have to wonder, is it a NASCAP tune or not? I mean, after all, ASCAP had about two million copyrights, and you had to study to be sure that no uh, ASCAP versions went on the air to anything, of anything. I did a Judy Canole show uh, with my quartet, the vocal quartet. And after two months, it went off the air of all things. Then I knocked around a bit, and Paul Mertz gave me my first job in the picture, uh, arranging some commercials. Then uh, I drifted into a new field entirely, a million miles away from what I've been doing. I went to a bar mitzvah, met a cantor, and he needed a choir leader. So I slipped into that field. Now I'm very deeply into the field of Jewish music, and I'm a director of uh, music at a big Jewish temple where a great many of the movie stars go. And, of course, many of you have heard about the jazz masses, the Catholic services that has been done. So it occurred to me, why not take a Jewish service and, you know, put jazz to it or Americanize it, which I did. And, of course, I used everything I ever heard in the go-kit band plus what I learned in the Jewish field, and I put them both together, and it was a pretty good blend. Uh, as far as my family, I don't know if anybody met my wife, but she's a wonderful girl, Dolly. Her name was Dolly Dawson. Met her in New York. Got married there. In fact, this week, we're married 39 years. Poor kid stuck with me all that time. I have two daughters. Uh, one is married, one is single. Married one has three children, two boys and a girl. And uh, if anything I've ever done or heard or had, the grandchildren are the greatest joy. If any of you are grandparents, you'll understand what I mean. Well, that's about it. It's late. And I just give you a little rundown of my what happened to me since we last met, as I said, aeons and aeons ago. And I hope you are all well. So long, friends. Hi there. This is Spiegel Wilcox, and it is October 25th, 1968. And this is being taped over in a little place called German, New York, which is about 25 miles from Cortland. It's our new home, and Helen and I have been here well, about three years, and the only ones that I know for sure is, let's see, 
Doc and Norma, you've been here. Bill Rank has been here. And Paul and Florence Mertz. And uh, I'm, I'm just like Chauncey. I, it, there's so much to say. And uh, I don't know, after I hear all you fellows talk, I don't know what this is going to sound like, but I'm kind of scared. I mean, I've never been scared before, but to talk after you fellows, it, it kind of bothers me a little bit. But I want to say, Doc, that you, uh, this idea of this tape, I think it's great. It certainly is. It's, uh, and the title, I loved your title, of What's Left of Cold Cat. And speaking of that, I mean, uh, that name all these years, ever since I left the band, and that was way back in 27 before it broke up. And uh, but, but all these years, uh, if in conversation if with other people, if you mentioned that you did play with the Gene Colquette band, boy, it, uh, they came out upstanding. And what a, what a terrific band, and uh, what a break. It's the same, uh, I feel the same as Chauncey again. I, I can't help but quote Chauncey in this way, that uh, he said that was one of the greatest breaks, and I noticed that he said that he got his break uh, chance to go with Goldcat through Russ Morgan. Well, while we're on that subject, I'll tell you who put me on. And that was good old Fuzzy. Uh, Fuzzy Ferrer, and uh, I'll never forget it. And it was, uh, well, that, uh, uh, that was one of my, I, I didn't, I knew that it was a terrific band, but I didn't realize it was such a, it was down in, 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 in history, so it's, uh, it just means all, uh, well, anyway, now I gotta keep going here because I, I got a few notes. Try to remember what I'm supposed to talk about. Anyway, uh, uh, it was so good to hear, to hear Chauncey and Bill Chalice. Bill, that that was a great speech you made. Loved every minute of it. And of course, Bill Rank. That trip uh, that that you took, you know, that was the first time that we heard uh, about the details of that, and uh, that must have been something else. Those people certainly gave you the red carpet, but you deserve it, Bill. Uh, I might, I might also say that um, a little later on, I'm gonna, I got a little music here to play, and um, that uh, Bill plays a terrific, terrific trombone. He is something else. In fact, some of the fellows in the band said he's kind of a cross between Bix and uh, Tea Garden, but he is in his own rights, Bill Rank, and Fuzzy. Fuzzy, why you talk just uh, why do you talk like a Wall Street banker? Wonderful. And uh, in the way, in the end that uh, hey, you remember Fuzzy, <laughs> you know we used to you know we'd say uh, yeah and you'd say yeah how's a kid how's a kid remember that Fuzzy? I bet every one of you guys remember that it was one of his uh, standard remarks. And see, you remember remember the time that uh, Fuzzy uh, you came on the job one night down in, there in the gray gray stone. And uh, I don't know, we just kind of kept building up, but the fellows in the band decided to say that, gee, you, uh, you don't look good tonight, Fuzzy. Do you feel all right? And uh, you'd say, yeah, I, f I feel all right, yeah. Then in a few minutes, somebody else would nail you, and they'd say, uh, gee, you, you feel all right, Fuzzy? You don't, your color's wrong or something. You'd go up to the mirror, and you'd look in, <laughs> and you'd say, gee, I, I don't know. You put your hand up to your face, look at yourself. You said, geez, I don't look too good, do I? But you weren't laughing. And, but anyway, that built up, and uh, as I remember, I think that, that you went home. <laughs> you had been sold on the idea that you weren't feeling well, and there you were perfectly normal, but... Well, does anyone remember that at all? Uh, it seems, though, I don't think I dreamt that, but it was really, really something. And... Uh, <laughs> oh, dear, oh, there's so much to say. Oh, and Chauncey... <laughs> Do you remember that? Here's a story I remember you told. I'm sure it was you, and I've used it quite a few times in my life. And that was about uh, the rube, the old rube that went to New York City and uh, he had to stay overnight, and he went into this hotel and to get a room, and he went up to the desk, and the fella whirled the register around, and the fella at the desk said, hey, uh, sign right here, he says. And he says, the rube looked up at him, and he said, he said, no sir. He says, I, I ain't a going to sign no illegal documents. And he said, the fellow laughed. He knowed I had him. <laughs> I even laugh every time I tell it, Chauncey. And, <laughs> oh, another thing, you know, there's another thing. Uh, uh, 
Chauncey, uh, you, you spoke about that horn recording. You know, I got, I was very interested in that because, I, you know, I played, uh, I don't know if you know this, but I did play in a band called Paul Whiteman's Collegian. It was a group out of Cornell made up of about uh, around eight fellas. And uh, I don't know, we made a tune called That Redhead Gal and I Cried For You and a couple more. And, and we did, we, and we recorded, I remember, just like you said, uh, we had little tin horns, I mean, coming out at us. Then they all, the small end of the horns went in through a sort of a velvet curtain into this great big thick chunk of uh, yellow, round chunk of yellow wax. So I was interested in that. I, I do remember that, Chauncey. And, um, now wait a minute, let me see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, dear, 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 dear. Oh, let me see, where am I? <laughs> Oh, and Doc, I want to tell you, uh, or have I already said, spoke about what an idea this is? Oh, it is. I, I've, I've said that. Yeah. Oh, I can't impress upon you too much. This this thing will be something. I, I'm I'm uh, I'm very anxious to hear Itsy and uh, his remarks and anything he's going to throw at us. And uh, and Paul, I want to hear Paul Mertz, and I want to hear Russ. And good old we. Of course, we aren't going to hear good old Don Murray and Howdy, and of course Bix, and Steve. Oh dear, let's see. And I'd like to hear, uh, I wonder if Ray Ludwig, anybody knows about Red, maybe, maybe, I'm afraid he's gone. But it would be something to hear those fellows. As a matter of fact, when Helen and I went uh, out to Michigan State uh, for Newell and Charlie and I, our two sons, uh, went to school, uh, Coming back from Michigan State one day, we, uh, we, we I, I was about, I guess we were about parallel with Saginaw, Michigan, on our road map anyway, and we called. I tried to see if I could get Howdy, and sure enough, I did. And he said, you stay right there. He says, I'm going to drive right down. I don't know, we were probably around 30 miles. And Howdy Quixel came, let's see, I, how, how long ago would that be, Pigeon? In the 50s. Yeah, around in the 1950s somewhere. And, but anyway, Howdy Quixel came down, and I'll never, that was, that was the only time I ever saw him since the band broke up. And Howdy was a great big guy. Oh, he was huge. And, and uh, I remember another thing, a little different thing he had. He had, he had what they call, he got bifocals and then a trifocal. We talked about that, but he had a big smile, and oh, he had a, he, he, he was just himself again. And of course, he was a big Corby liquor salesman. And, oh, we got a terrific kick out of that. I wish we could have gone back to Saginaw, but yeah, we didn't. A beautiful daughter. Oh, and he showed us a picture of his daughter. Oh, she was a doll, or she is a doll. And, oh, I, I enjoyed that so much, too. Well, now, let me see. Wait, um, oh, maybe, um, oh, and Steve. Well, we went uh, on our way back in, we went by way of Detroit. And we found out, you know, where we could see him, and uh, we went down to the apartment, and uh, we had a long visit with him, and it was more fun. Oh, he was that slow-talking man, and uh, he had the old expressions. And I think, I think his wife had died down. He felt very, very bad about that, as you all know. And. But anyway, uh, he said, I think he complained of arthritis. He had quite a bad case of that of his, his hands. It, it bothered him to play. But he was also, I think, a uh, officer in the Union there in, in uh, Detroit. So, and, and then we'd exchange cards at Christmas time and uh, little things like that. And he, he was very nice. He, it was just great to, to talk to him and, um, and write him, which is very little. I mean, that I did. I'm very lame on that, and I'm sorry to say. Uh, oh, now let me see. Uh, I, I just wrote down some names here, you know, so I'll, I'll speak probably at uh, incoherent a little bit. But, oh, here's another name too, Phil Evans. I'm sure, I'll uh, bet every one of you fellows have been, you know, uh, written to about, uh, in regards to Bix. Phil Evans, you know, from Bakers, I think it's Bakers, Bakersfield, California. And, oh, and by the way, I had the pleasure of meeting him at uh, uh, one of the, uh, see, um, we went to, let's see, uh, we, we went out to uh, California uh, oh, a few years ago, and we went to Paul and Florence Mertz's house, and Paul had invited Phil Evans 
and his new bride to, to come down to the house, down to his house. And I'll never forget that evening. That was a, oh, that was fun. Uh, and so, and we realized that uh, oh, Paul has such a large amount of equipment, recording equipment, and records and tapes. And, oh, I remember this too. Uh, he sat down to play the piano there, and I got out the horn. And he and I had a little fun right there, just playing some, uh, oh, just pretty, pretty little tasty tunes. And that was such a big kick. But it was fun to meet Phil Evans. A real sincere, nice, modest fellow. Uh, anything I think that, that we did for him, I know, I think was... In fact, I, I'm, I would love to see his book. Uh, he tried so in earnest to, uh, you know, so sincere to get the actual dates and not take other uh, uh, records, or I mean dates of uh, other writers. As you all know, probably some of the stuff that... Some of the writings of the other... Uh, People uh, have been, uh, uh, you know, some of it hasn't been true. And uh, now let's see. Uh, you, you know, while I'm um, thinking here of some things more to say, would you, would you like to hear? Uh, uh, here's a here's a, a a big thrill we got when Bill was here, Bill Rank, here in um, you know just this last July seventh was it? July seventh. Oh, right over here to the right. Hey there. Hey there. This is uh, Speaker Wilcox from Cortland, New York, and now I'm living over at German. Who ever heard of German? German, and it's actually near Cincinnati. And anyone close to central New York knows Cincinnati, that for sure. This is a very, very extraordinary occasion. And I just want, uh, you're going to hear a, a voice of a guy that uh, I haven't seen in 40 years. It's almost 40 years. I had the privilege and the honor and the occasion to play with a band called Gene Goldcut. And that was some band and lots of people that uh, heard of it and remember it and know it. And uh, this is my old buddy and sidekick that played trombone. I played trombone. He played trombone. We had two trombones. And this is none other than Bill Rank, who lives in Cincinnati. And I'm going to let uh, Bill uh, introduce himself and, and just say where he's going, how, what the occasion was, and how we, how we got together today. And you're going to have a lot of goodies, I hope. Good, Bill. Hi, Spiegel. Well, of course, this is my first trip up here. And as uh, you said, I haven't seen you in about almost 40 years. But uh, it's been a real, real pleasure. And uh, you have a beautiful place up here. And we're going to try and uh, get together here and blow a couple of... Uh, notes, be they sour or sweet, we don't know which, but uh, uh, we're going to try and do something. And last night, uh, Spiegel uh, played a job, and I went along, and uh, although I wasn't hired for the job, but I played the job, you know? So, anyway, uh, uh, we had a lot of fun, and uh, we sat up till about 3 or 4 o'clock this morning listening to tapes. And, anyway, anyway. Yeah, uh, that's right. So, uh, we finally got to sleep and uh, got up early this morning, and we were out here about 20 miles from Cortland, right out and where it's real quiet. You don't hear anything. You don't see anything. A uh, beautiful lake and two beautiful Labrador Retriever dogs, and, oh, it's just wonderful. I can't say how much I enjoy it. So, anyway, enough of this small talk. We're going to try and... Uh, yeah, play. well, I want, I want them to understand that I'm playing an old Val... I mean, a, well, rather, rather a new Val in the bone. And so, uh, even though my fingers, my uh, the three that I'm going to try to uh, manipulate this thing are, are a little rusty, I'm going to try, and I want you to hear Bill Wright. That is the biggest kick that my whole band got last night, including myself, is to hear Bill operate. So, uh, here's, I'll tell you, incidentally, this is something we played last night that we started off with this. Of course, Bill and I are going to play this without any bass or nothing. And so, see what happens, though, Bill. All right, here we go.
I wish we had time to uh, play more of that tape. Uh, but uh, we got so much to talk about here. Oh, see, I want to be sure and mention and mention this. Uh, the, the great Frankie Trombar. Uh, as I remember, Frankie, uh, let's see, Russ led the band first, as far as, far as I'm concerned. He, he was a leader, and then, uh, I don't know in what ro uh, rotation, but Frankie Trombar, of course, led the band for quite a long time. And remember Eddie Sheesby? Sure, Eddie led. And how about George <laughs> George Crozier? There was somebody else. What a fine arranger, too. How about that? And uh, and then, oh, I forgot. Why, how could I? I wouldn't forget. Charlie Horvath. There was, well, where would the band been without Charlie? After all, he was uh, he was something. And, and, and do you remember? I bet, oh, you all remember. There was two famous bouncers. There was Charlie Stanton. Remember, he had his hair right slicked right back. And handsome Pat the Irishman, remember? And uh, oh yeah, and another, oh another fellow that a man that used to come there regularly, kind of an elderly fellow, nice looking man. I think his name was Liggett. Do you remember him? Any of you? And say, speaking about uh, people, how about Lamar? Remember Lamar? And without him, how uh, what a, what shape would the toilets been in if it hadn't been for Lamar? Well, now just let me. Uh, oh. Uh, Oh, oh! I want to mention this. One of the this is probably one of the highlights of of my time in my life. Uh, about five years ago, we were up at uh, Lake Louise, up in Banff, just on a on a on a, on a uh, vacation, and uh, we, we met um, our daughter Cynthia. Oh, there's there's somebody else right there. All of you that do know Cynthia, of course I'm prejudiced, but I think she's a uh, she's something else. Well, anyway, we met Cynthia at Calgary Airport, and off the plane, I'm, I'm going to tell this kind of fast, off the plane got uh, uh, Charlie Teagarden from Las Vegas and uh, Matty, uh, uh, Matt, Lack, uh, Matt Lack, and Eddie Miller. And uh, uh, we had, had a great hug and kisses, and, uh, and they said, guess what, we're going to be up in Banff, that's only about 90 miles away, tomorrow night for a one-nighter. And I said, well, that's wonderful, I want to hear you, I'll be up. I said, we'll come along. And he said, guess who we're going to, uh, who's going to join us? And I said, who? He says, none other than Joe, Joe Venuti. Well, so I'll tell this kind of fast. We got up there that, uh, uh, the next night, and the, they were playing for a big oil, uh, big oil men's uh, convention, all the presidents of these big oil companies. Very closed affair in this big ballroom of this old famous hotel at Banff. And uh, somehow or other, um, Cynthia wiggled in the, the door enough so she got Joe's eye. And, uh, and and so he, said, he motioned for her to come in. And so uh, apparently something went along, something like this. Uh, she must have said that my daddy happens to have his trombone. And Joe said, he said, I'll dare you. He said, I'll dare him to get it out. So I sure took the advantage of that. I, and I went up and I told him, look, I won't get in your way, fellows. I'll promise I won't, I won't pay over, play over eight bars. If I fit, okay. If I don't, out. And it just so happened they had everything in a Dixieland combination there but a trombone. So anyway, I played along, and well, uh, here's another quick story. We played uh, like Riverboat Shuffle, Mylenberg Joys, Clarinet Marmalade, all those tunes, and well, I just had a ball till one o'clock. That was just out of this world. And uh, Joe, oh, I had a great grand visit with him. So there you see, um, I, I, I don't know, I've rambled on here quite a long time, and uh, what else? Uh, I'll, look, I'll just shut it off for a second, and if I can think of something else, I'll come back. I left the uh, 
I left the Goldcap Band in 1927 to come home and uh, go into business with my dad in the coal business. And as you all know, uh, the coal business is out the window, it's done. It's hard to believe that the great, famous King Coal could have been washed out. But So we grabbed onto oil, and uh, we have a nice oil business, and, uh, and now we're in the tire business, and I'm in, uh, with business with, in business with um, Newell Jr. and Charlie Wilcox. How lucky can you get to have your two boys right in business with you? And uh, uh, let's see. Um, oh, and I still have a band. Uh, I, I started, uh, oh, three, four years later after I got back, I got kind of itchy for music, so I had formed my own band, and so we play just on weekends. And now let's see. Well, as long as you fellows all played by yourselves, maybe I should give, give you a little tune all by myself without, without Bill Rank backing me up. So uh, here goes. My name is Joe Venuti, and I'm telling you the God's honest truth. I was really surprised to see you tonight, you and your lovely wife. And um, after all these years, we finally see Doc Riker. And we used to call him the original doctor of the band, you know, in those days, back in 1923, 24, and 25. And uh, it's a funny thing, Doc, you know, uh, just before I met you tonight, I ran into this gentleman here, and he asked me to say a few words on his tape machine for his radio station. And he opened up a page uh, some of an album of mine, and uh, there was a the picture of the original Gold Cat band. And there you were on the front, and I said, why, heck, that's Doc Riker. He's in here tonight. And we came about it that way. Have you seen the picture? Yes. Oh, you probably have. That's, the, that's our first picture we ever took. Mm -hmm. Doc, you know, going back in the old days, I'll never forget when we were playing with the band and then uh, unbeknownst to us, there was a terrific jazz band we heard on radio. And uh, do you recall that band? No, I don't think so. Oh, yes, you do. I'm, uh, we, if I bring it back, well, it was, uh, we heard them for about a week on, on the radio and they played at WJZ, was it? Or 
WWJ? Yeah. That, that's the station in Detroit. And, and the man, the guys in the band were going crazy. What a great band that is. And it was compromised of Don Murray, Tommy Dorsey, and Jimmy. And we didn't know it. The guys were in our own band. Do you remember now? <laughs> no, I don't think I heard that one. Well, that's oh, fun. no, no, that's that's the truth. And, yeah. the, and it was the, the first week we got radio at the old Greystone. Yeah. And they called themselves, I don't know, the Salt City Salt Shakers. <laughs> and they took a picture, and the picture was in the paper, but uh, you couldn't see their faces. They had their hats over their heads, you know. <laughs> do you remember that, or don't you? No, I'm You sure don't I remember? Don't. No. <laughs> well, I do it, because uh, it impressed me very much. Mm -hmm. That's why I remember it. After the band broke up. No, no, that's, no. that was well, the, the first band. Not after the band broke no, up. But, but after our band broke up, what did you do then? Oh, uh, well, I went with Paul Whiteman then. No, I, didn't no, I went with Roger Wolf Kahn for about a year, and then I, I went back to Paul Whiteman, because uh, before I joined the Goldhead band, I was with Paul, you know. Mm -hmm. And I told him I was going on a three-month vacation, and I joined the band back again. In the meantime, Tommy and Jimmy sent me a wire, and he says, you come out here, Detroit. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Horvath, he heard a fiddle. He says, what can I do with a violin in the band? You remember this. <laughs> and uh, and you, you guys had a fiddle player. Charlie Hamill. That's right. And uh, so Charlie says, uh, how could I, how, how, what am I going to do with Charlie Hamill? I said, well, you leave it up to me. I, I'll talk broken English to him for about three weeks. <laughs> and Charlie Hamill says, well, how come they play jazz in Italy? And I had to talk broken. I says, hey, in Italy, they play the jazz. They, 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 put, the, the, they put a fire underneath the chair, and you play hot, hot, ding, 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 ding. He says, well, you play pretty good, though, for an Italian. I said, well, in Italy, you come and do you play the jazz? Ding, 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 ding. And I was playing all cornball music. So he finally accepted it, see? So after a month there, and uh, I start talking real good, the best way I know how, he says, man, you learn English pretty fast, don't you? I'm the best I can. <laughs> and I'll never forget, God bless his soul, Charlie Horvath. They, you know, a lot of fellas, they profess that their, their sock symbol belongs to this. And you remember, Doc, uh, that contraption, he had two big symbols, and he had rubber bands around him and tapes and uh, leather around him, and he used to tack one on to his top of his, of his foot, the top symbol, and then hit it down. And that was the first first uh, thing of the sock symbol. First he had it on a chair, and then he had one in his hand, and he would play the afterbeat with his hand. And we had some great guys in that band. Never forget it. Paul Mertz and Dewey Bergman. What was it? You remember when I first joined the band? Paul wasn't with the band. We had a tall Bill Kranz. Bill Kranz, yeah. Bill Kranz, you remember him? Sure, yeah. sure. And Dewey. Yeah. And Dewey played wonderful piano, though. And yeah. arranged, a good arranger. Yeah. Then we had. Uh, Bill Miller for a while. Bill, yeah. And uh, Eddie Sheesby was a great arranger. Yeah. And uh, I think the. Crozier? George, George, old George Crozier, sure. Yeah. <laughs> never made a mistake in copying part, boy. Yeah. Never. Yeah. You remember? Yeah. You know, I got a call the other night from uh, our good friend from up in Auburn, New York. He's the uh, he's the original coal man up there, they call him. Spiegel Wilcox. <laughs> 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 we had a good time up in Banff and... Uh, I didn't even know if uh, Spiegel was there, but we were playing some jazz, and all of a sudden, way off in the distance, we heard this trombone, and there, there he was, Spiegel, <laughs> laughing it up as usual. Great guy. He carries it with him every place he goes. Every place he goes. Yeah, wonderful. Well, it's nice to be back with the old boys again, I'll tell you that. Most of them are going. I haven't seen Fuzzy in uh, a long time. Yeah, he hasn't been too well. No, huh? mm -hmm. that's too bad. I see Paul now and then. Whatever happened to Irish Henry? I don't know. I have the faintest idea. And Ray, Ray, I know Ray passed on. Ray Ludwig. And Hardy. Yeah, Hardy's gone. Hardy's gone. Murray's gone. Tommy, Jimmy. And how is the old Bill Ranko? Have you seen him? Yeah, he was up at my house last uh, last summer. Beautiful. And he's going to be up again the 14th of June. He's going to Holland. He really is. And then he, he works away. He, I, that's about, well, he, he, he'll always play good. Yeah. Well, you you went with uh, Crosby, too, for a while, didn't you? Yeah, I, I, joined, I joined Bing Crosby. I stayed with Bing for about 12 years. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I had my own groups. I had a bunch of groups and this and that. And then finally that war came along and I wound up with so many girls in the band that uh, I had to give up. <laughs> I had a girl playing tuba. Yeah. <laughs> That's the end. Well, you've been living in Seattle, haven't you? Yeah, I moved I moved from uh, California. I went up to Seattle and I love it very much up there. Yeah. Now I'm uh, working with uh, Phil Harris most of the yeah. time. And how about a little about your family now? Oh, my family all doing real good, and they got five Most kids. Most of us don't even know you got children. Oh, yeah, well, I got five children. Tell them. Yeah, I got two boys, that both doctors, and and three girls that married well, very well married. And they all they all play a little music, you know. And, yeah. But they they like our type of music. <coughs> they like uh, good jazz, solid jazz music. Mm -hmm. Good, real good, solid saxophone section, a good trombone section, good trumpet section. And a good rhythm section. Yeah. Well, that's about the that's about the extent of uh, my knowledge that I know. But yeah. I certainly I not, know you've done a lot more than that I in know. that length of time. But, but Doc, uh, I'll tell you the truth. You're sure playing uh, wonderful now. Thank you very much. But I I really miss the old gang. I really miss mm -hmm. the old boys. Mm -hmm. The next ex gold kidder will introduce himself by playing a tune that he wrote back in 1927 when he was a member of that grand old band. you ex-cold kidders and whoever might be interested in hearing these various accounts of the former members. This won't be a hardship for me talking about the old Gene Goldkit band because it's one of my favorite reminiscing subjects and I really feel grateful that I was a part of that fine organization and the great people I met through being a member of the band. When I joined 
the Greystone Band back in 1923. I was a youngster, and though I wasn't exactly a novice, I'd been playing around in, in bands of reasonable reputation. Uh, I had plenty to learn still, and I couldn't have gotten with a finer bunch of musicians to learn from. And I always have been very thankful for that association just in the grounding I got and the helpful advice received in this way. <laughs> 